Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Canadian Canoe Museum's virtual public meeting for our new museum. My name is Kate Kennington, and I will be your Q&A moderator for this evening. We are just going to give everyone a moment to connect before we get officially started. Uh, tonight's format is a webinar, which means we cannot see or hear you. So if you are still enjoying your dinner, please continue to enjoy. That said, there will be opportunities tonight to connect using the chat and the Q&A functions. We will get started in just a moment. And while we wait, we encourage you to say hello and where you are joining from using the chat function. Wonderful to see people from so many places. Welcome all. So we do have a few housekeeping notes before we begin. You will notice that the automated closed captioning is on for accessibility. If you'd like to turn it off for yourself, please click the CC button and then select hide subtitles. Throughout the presentation, please feel free to use the chat function, usually this is found at the bottom or side of your screen, to share your comments, feedback, and connect with one another. We also have a team member, Cindy, here to help and support and answer any basic questions in the chat. There are a lot of people who have joined us this evening, and we do ask that you use kindness and respect in your comments. You can submit questions at any time throughout the presentation by using the Q&A button at the bottom or side of your screen. These will be grouped together and asked at the end of the presentation during the Q&A panel. As you can see on the screen, our schedule for the evening includes a presentation that will take about an hour and will cover our journey and vision, the exhibits, the construction process, sharing the site plan and renderings, and our project schedule. We will then open it up for questions and we will have project partners, board directors and consultants joining our speakers to answer your questions for the remaining 40 minutes. We will try to get as many as we can. Please note that we will be prioritizing questions that relate to rezoning, things such as traffic, environment, site plan and land use, as that is the focus for this evening. And now I would like to pass the microphone over to Carolyn Hislop, Executive, Executive Director of the Canadian Canoe Museum to introduce the rest of our speakers for this evening and formally begin the presentation. Thank you, Kate. Wonderful to see everybody, hear everybody and figuring out where they're signing in from. Thank you so much for joining us. We're really excited to share our plans for the new museum um, on the water here in Peterborough and excited to get started. So in order to begin in the right way, I'd like to begin with our acknowledgement. The Canadian Canoe Museum respectfully acknowledges that we are situated on the Treaty 20 Michisagi traditional territory covered by the Williams Treaty First Nations. The museum recognizes as well the contributions of Métis, Inuit and Indigenous peoples in shaping this community and this country as a whole. As an organization, we steward the world's largest and most comprehensive collection of canoes, kayaks, and paddled watercraft. And in all that we do, we fully commit and will, to honoring and sharing the cultural stories and the histories within the collection in everything that we do. For those of you that are not on the traditional territory of the Michisagi, I request that through the chat function, if you could indicate the indigenous territory that you are on at this point in time, it would be great to see where everybody's calling in from. Thanks so much. Next slide. I'd like to introduce who the panelists are that'll be joining and speaking about our project tonight. So you've got myself, Carolyn Heslop, Executive Director here at the Canadian Canoe Museum. Our Chair of the Board, Victoria Grant. Hello, Vicki. She is here with us as well. Bill Lett, the Managing Principal of Lett Architects. And Jeremy Ward, the Curator of the Canadian Canoe Museum. Working behind the scenes to make sure this webinar goes off without any issues, we have our host, Rachella Giordano. We have running the Q&A, you already heard from Kate Kennington. And then running the chat function is Cindy Mytruck. 
And then there's a number of other panelists that you're going to meet during the Q&A section, and we'll introduce you to those folks later on. So it is my honor to turn this over to Vicki Grant, our chair, to get us started and share the journey that we've been on for the last year or so. Vicki? Thank you. Um, wow, it has been some something um, quite significant this past year. Um, and we have uh, had our work cut out for us and we've been had some ups and downs and we've just been um, putting our head down and getting getting looking for what how and how we would move forward um, I want to thank all of our um, all of you for coming tonight that's really quite something um, to see the number of people who are joining the call and um, it is uh, you know it's funny as I think about where we've been and how we've uh, on as we talk about this being a journey and how you can move forward um, but yet you need you think you have all your plans laid out and, and you think that these things are going to be okay but there's a bigger plan for us up there sometimes and, and we don't we end up in places where we we didn't know we would end up and I think in some cases, that's the that's the transition the board and the Canoe Museum and all of us have been on. Um, you know, when I think of last year, this time, um, well, actually earlier than right now, it was early March when we started to, um, when the COVID, pan, you know, the pandemic hit us and um, it changed everybody's plans everybody in the country and we were all affected differently but in some ways there's good things that happen and I don't think that if we were doing this public meeting in Peterborough we'd have 278 people on the call at six o'clock that's in, in a room anywhere so I, I see good and bad and, and all of this stuff and um, so we but as a result of all of this, we were hoping to have the shovel in the ground at the lift, lift lock site. But um, when COVID hit, we shut down the campaign and project due, you know, because of that. Um, and then in May, the discovery, of, we announced the discovery of the contaminated groundwater on the um, lift lock site from the neighboring property. That was a big shock to all of us, but um, we, we had to take the time. We, we, had, we did take the time to really think about how, what the effect and what we, how we would move forward. Um, and it, it, you know, we, 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 I guess what I would say is I, as I watched our board, our team and the people that we've worked with engage, there was never a time where we would have said there isn't going to be a canoe museum. And the hardest decision was to, to know that that site was no longer feasible, that we couldn't move forward there. And once we made that decision, it was there were, the canoe still needed a home. We, we still needed a site. And I can't thank the board enough for the work. I can't thank Carolyn and her team for their commitment and to bring us to this place we are today. So enjoy your evening because you're, you're in for um, a, a treat. There's, there's some really neat stuff happening and um, I really hope that you will enjoy the, the uh, evening and uh, ask lots of questions. So thank you. And I'll turn it over to Carolyn. Thank you, Vicki. Um, yeah, it has been quite the journey. And in looking when the board made that decision that that site was no longer viable for our project, 
um, we began that search for an alternative location. And we were guided through that entire process by the museum's values and our project goals, which were ultimately to create a new home for 100% of this collection that we care for in a safe and accessible building. We needed to make sure that we were on the water, ideally on the lake, so that we could offer more on water canoeing and kayaking programs to the community and the visiting public. We wanted to make sure that we had a site that actually could be developed in the, in the timing and the schedule that we needed, which was to be shovel in the ground by, the, by fall of this year. And then we also needed a site that could meet our budget and that we could develop on the property in such a way that would, you know, um, address the new realities that we are all living in as we're still going through this pandemic. And so we have fortunately landed at a beautiful property that does all of this. We've assembled a team that I am proud to say is meeting all these requirements. And we're on a path um, to validating what we can do um, on this property. And so in January, we began that, that process of validating our project. And I'm happy to say that we're almost there. We're just a, probably a month or so away from completing that particular piece of work. And while we are still validating, I'm happy to say that at the moment, we anticipate our costs for the new building on the Johnson site to be in the range of 35 to $40 million. And then throughout the last year, we've been so encouraged by our, our community of donors and funders, members and volunteers, staff and the board that have continued to push us forward, to keep us working and to keep, they were asking us to give them hope, give them something to look forward to. And I think we all need that in these days. And so I'm thrilled to share with you tonight that in the last few months, we've raised just over $2 million of new funds to this project. And so we're about 90% funded at this point in time. So we are on a really great path and we're about to get into it with you, but I wanted to share that with you. And I think you'll start to see that at the core of all of the work that the museum is doing right now, and in particular, with this new project at Johnson site. A real focus is on building relationships and meaningful, thoughtful and authentic relationships in everything that we do. And this project on this new site has allowed us to refocus in that direction. And so I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Jeremy, who is going to share with you uh, some of the work and how relationships are core to the exhibit development process as we build this new museum. Carolyn, you talk, you mentioned relationships, and I think it's important if you're interested in museums anywhere and everywhere, those that care for collections that come from Indigenous communities, uh, First Nations, uh, Métis, Inuit, Indigenous peoples, all are on an existential journey now, uh, looking for um, new ways in which they can serve the larger community. And the term we've put up here, collaborative relations, is a term that we use to describe how the Canoe Museum reaches out across the country to the communities of origin for the watercraft that it is honored to care for and how it creates space within its exhibits and other areas for these communities to share their knowledge and their perspective, their languages to a wider audience uh, through the museum. The canoe and kayak, from where I sit goes without saying, are, are, are inventions by indigenous peoples across Turtle Island, across Canada and around the world. And we recognize that they retain an enduring relationship to the canoe and the kayak today. We are honored to care for the watercraft from these many, many traditions. So as we embark on developing a, a new home that can properly care and share a collection like this, we've been propelled and also in the exhibits development and uh, an ambitious program reaching out to communities across the country, um, to the communities of origin, and the, uh, the places where many of these canoes and kayaks come from. To do that right well and in a good way, we, uh, we needed a few essential tools. So in, in response to the 2015 Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the calls to action, in 2018, the Canoe Museum 
uh, developed its own principles for engaging and consulting with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities. Uh, in accompaniment to that too, we have also uh, developed a repatriation policy to have full uh, and caring conversations wherever they may have to lead. Uh, and these are all built upon strong, open relations. So our approach has been to begin locally uh, and expand nationally and build upon our, our existing relations and the relations of our relations and so on and so forth. And in 2019, uh, that journey took us physically from coast to coast to coast, uh, following many of the canoes and kayaks back to their communities, if you will. <clears throat> Collaborative relations during the year 2020, during the year of this pandemic, and of course, the collapse of the LiftLock project has not been idle, I'm happy to say. Uh, and in fact, uh, as we shifted to working online, uh, a lot of these relationships have grown uh, and, and expanded in, in, in good ways and caring ways. And in fact, we've developed some new relationships during this period of time as well towards exhibit development and understanding how to care for a collection like the one we do. So our approach, our, our engagement strategy uh, for the exhibit development with each community supports the recruiting and hiring of community coordinators in their own community to stay safely uh, in community, to work with their own elders, their knowledge holders, their community research protocols, their language speakers, uh, and to develop uh, with us the exhibits that we will share the stories uh, that, that surround a, an artifact collection like this. And so all of this work is governed by uh, research agreements that, that are being co-developed with these communities and that respect uh, these communities' relations to the ownership, the control, the access and possession of this community knowledge, of course. And speaking of possession of knowledge, it's important to point out that um, all of the work through the exhibit development will be archived in the communities that we work with or wherever they choose to to designate where this the, these uh, materials are going to be kept. I'll take the, uh, the next slide, if you please. So now I want to take you upstairs in our new museum. Uh, we'll talk a bit about, more about this soon, but uh, there's a 17,000 square foot exhibits hall. It's being de designed and developed to class A museum control standards. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit more, but this is an impressive space. This has a vaulting cathedral ceiling. A, a room that was also designed to care for the largest object in our collection, which is, in fact, is not a canoe, but it's a building. It's a 19th century Hudson Bay Company fur trade era building, and it's in a really important point position for a lot of our programming. And the exhibits development work that uh, we, we continue to work on has been now ongoing for several years. Um, we've added some capacity to our core team here at the Canoe Museum. I'm delighted with the increased talent and capacity on our curatorial team and that we continue to work with GSM Project, an exhibit development design firm out of Montreal. They've been with us for many years now. But as I mentioned earlier, we've also are onboarding community coordinators who are working with knowledge holders within their communities across the country to help us develop this. The 17,000 square foot exhibits zone or uh, hall is divided up into seven principal exhibits. So if, uh, if you don't mind strapping on your rollerblades or hopping on a bike with me, I'm gonna, I would love to take a few hours or even a day to, to walk you through all the great work that's been there, but we're just gonna touch lightly on the seven exhibit zones. First place we start is in the Headwaters exhibit. And this, um, this idea traces back to a creative workshop we held in 2019 with a number of uh, First Nations, Métis and Inuit knowledge holders, canoe makers, artists, language speakers. In fact, as the, participants were signing in. I, I saw at least one of them uh, uh, announce themselves. So great to have you here. And one of the takeaways we learned uh, in that creative workshop is you need a central gathering space, a place where people can, can, can gather, get their groundings. They have sight lines to all the areas and, uh, and special events can take place here. And so for that, we've called this Headwaters. It's important to note that uh, the Kinu Museum is located in Nogojiwanong at the foot of the rapids or not far from what used to be the end of a nine mile portage on Michisagi territory and so that will be very present here. But another important theme that you'll encounter here is water and that's going to carry you throughout the entire exhibits uh, experience. The energy of water um, as it gathers its energy flowing to the sea. This is a, a theme that's going to take you through the whole exhibit space. 
The next exhibit we, uh, we, we drop in on, if you're walking in a clockwise direction, is called All My Relations. And this is a celebration of the canoe in all its forms uh, across Turtle Island, across Canada and around the world. Uh, I can't see the full text there, but uh, we're not showing uh, photographs of the exhibit zones yet. Um, the canoe uh, is a connection to the landscape and to its waters. And more than that, it's an object around which communities gather and they make connections. So in this exhibit, uh, you'll see a rich and diverse uh, portrait of the heritage of the canoe and kayak across the country and around the world. And also how the canoe inspires people of all backgrounds to find deep personal connections with each other and with the natural world around them. The next exhibit called Connected by Canoe is essentially the object that was at the center of these communities now takes us out on a journey. Uh, to points of intersection with other peoples, building new relations, new points of intersection. As we understand this more, we appreciate that um, the canoe also uh, was at the heart of ancient networks of trade and alliance, uh, and that has formed lasting relations today that, that survive to today. These intersections also uh, include newcomers to the area, of course, taking us through the whole era of the fur trade and the, the age of, uh, of course, the, the lively voyager, but also the, the, uh, the birth of the Métis people uh, through the fur trade, uh, who have their own um, iconic connections with the canoe, especially in Ontario, but uh, right across the country. The canoe also brings us to some difficult times in colonial history, and we are creating space for different perspectives on these points of intersection at different periods in, in our own history. The next exhibit zone is design, ingenuity, and the maker. And this is really where we deconstruct the object itself to get deeper meanings from it. Because the canoe, at, at, at its heart, the canoe and the kayak are very simple ideas, essentially small boats pointed at both ends, paddled or propelled facing forward, if you will. But really, anytime you try to pick that apart, it defies that de definition. And that's because it is so much more. It reflects all of the, all of the uh, prioritizations, all of the choices of the maker and the user and the landscape on which it's traveled. So it might carry cutting edge design, both ancient, but also how those echoes um, reach out to modern times and influence contemporary watercraft design. We also look at new opportunities, new traditions being formed. And of course, the fact that Peterborough for over a century was the industrial epicenter of wooden canoe manufacturing. is another important reason why P the Canadian Canoe Museum can celebrate its location here in Peterborough. And so that, that's, that, that'll be the whole exhibit, uh, the whole idea of canoe manufacturing to new markets will have a big presence there. The next exhibit, Pushing the Limits, explores the idea that the canoe can cause us to do incredible things where we learn to push our own limits uh, and we can also learn of our own strength. Canoeing can cause us to encounter risk, whether we're stepping uh, away from the shore for the first time, or indeed if we hop in a canoe and manage to paddle from Manitoba all the way to Brazil, as one of the canoes in our collection can, can tell. We're also gonna learn about risk, and occasionally tragedy. And through this uh, exhibit, we'll also learn about high performance achievement, international exhibit, uh, in, international organization that might take us to the Olympics, the remarkable and great expeditions of canoeists uh, over the centuries and the internal forces that cause some people to accomplish these, these great feats. The second last exhibit uh, we call Inspiration. And mind you, these are all at working titles, so they may change uh, in the weeks and months ahead. Um, inspiration is, uh, looks into how canoeing can be a transformative experience and foster deeper engagement with ourselves and with the world around us. This activity can cause us to build communities and it can also inspire us to take action to protect the environment and make connections with others who um, foster better stewardship of the environment itself. Our last exhibit is the temporary exhibit zone. And this is going to, of course, drive repeat visitation to the Canadian Canoe Museum where we renew this space on a yearly basis or we'll find out the period for those renewals. And so the first exhibit, zone, or first exhibit that we're going to feature here is a really important one. And this is to tell the story, the remarkable journey of the Canadian Canoe Museum over its many chapters. This is a long epic journey and like the waters working their ways to the sea, it's a story that begins 70 years ago with a remarkable collector and inspired individual named Kirk Whipper, who began a collection at a summer camp, created the Kanawha Museum. And then 30 years ago, uh, it found a second chapter of its life here in Peterborough. And I don't know um, if many attending tonight realize that 30 years ago, 
we have a photograph where Kirk Whipper, the founder of the collection, joined by Peterborough local John Jennings and uh, another founding board member, Jack uh, Matthews, stood on the shores right at our, at our intended location at the Johnson site, considering it as a home for this new museum to be built here in Peterborough. It's funny how things come full circle, circle after all this time. But we wanted to bring along all of the people who helped the Canoe Museum prosper over its many, many decades and in, welcome them into this new space and carry those stories with them. But we also wanna tell the remarkable journey of this third chapter as the Canoe Museum has worked its way through the last uh, several years, making its new home. And I'd like to introduce uh, our architect, uh, Bill Lett, to introduce himself, the project, and, uh, and the wonderful team that are helping us. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Uh, what what an honor it is to speak to all of you, and um, it's it's fascinating seeing everybody um, from around the world on uh, on this call. And some of my colleagues, I saw Jim Huffman in Vancouver. Um, it's great to see uh, great to see some of these names. Um, so, as far as the project is concerned, I'd like to start just a bit about our team. So, in a typical project, um, we start by developing what we are do going to design and build, and typically that only involves the owner and the architect. Later, we look at the how and the who, adding players as we go. Um, it's interesting that the who uh, that are going to actually construct the project don't usually have any involvement in the how of their work, um, let alone the what. And uh, so this project is utilizing integrated project delivery and things look very different in this process. We talk about what we're going to build, how we're going to build it and who is going to build it um, from the very beginning of the project. And that's critical because we have all the stakeholders um, uh, on board right from the start of the project. Uh, so that makes this, this type of approach fundamentally different than, than a typical approach that we might take in construction. Um, the early engagement of trade partners, uh, designers, owners, contractors, um, provides the opportunity for a much deeper level of, uh, of collaboration. Um, so we've started to build our team in integrated project delivery. The team continues to build all the way uh, through the process. Carolyn mentioned validation. We have um, implementation, which is next. So we're really starting at the beginning here. We're, we're 16 weeks into, into the design, but we have a series of project advisors that you can see on your screen. Um, and then on the integrated project delivery team, uh, lead architect, uh, here in Peterborough, we're the architects of record on the project. Um, the builders, the general contractors, Shandos Construction. Um, I should point out that Shandos is named for Shandos Lake. Um, the, uh, the two founders uh, both grew up in the area and, uh, and named their business after the lake. Uh, we have um, a series of consultants on board um, and trade partners as well. And the trade partners are key team players that we felt we needed on the team right away. Um, and you'll see that there's also some local involvement um, from team members um, such as our electrical trade partner, Lancer Electric, our landscape architects. Um, so it's really nice to, uh, to be able to bring that local content into the project as well. And, and I'll speak a bit more about um, that um, in the fact that it's a priority of the project to generate local economic impact as much as possible. So we're developing a plan um, uh, to prioritize this now, and we'll include lo lo uh, further local subtrades and labor as we as we move the project along. One uh, one element of this that I can tell you about um, is that we uh, um, have reached out to uh, to Fleming College to to look at involvement of the trade college at Fleming is in this project, as well as to a local general contractor Mortlock Construction that could help with this project as well. And that's one of the benefits of the integrated model is that, um, is that we can bring in these partnerships at various stages of the project. And, 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 and I can't tell you how excited I am about, uh, about being able to do that. But let's, let's move on and uh, let's talk about the site. Um, so the site is um, uh, on uh, the east side of Little Lake in East City. Um, it's framed by the uh, Parks Canada headquarters to the north, Ashburnham Drive to the east, Whitlock Creek to the south, and Little Lake to the west. Um, the Trent Severn Lock 20 is to the northwest, um, although it's hidden under that happy family. Uh, and um, uh, that provides connections to the downtown uh, through Rogers Cove and over the pedestrian bridge. 
So working from a macro level to a micro level, the whole site wants to be about the visitor experience, whether that be moving through the site actively, visiting the museum, or coming for programming and education. The goal is to fundamentally engage the visitor with the experience, um, with, with an experience that's framed in the natural environment and speaks to the collection and craftsmanship, um, whether or not they're coming into the museum. As we develop the design, um, we're taking a multidisciplinary approach to um, crime prevention that uses the site, architectural design, and the management of the built natural environment into consideration. The goal is to enhance what currently is great about this site. Part of this will be the fulfillment of the Little Lake Master Plan that will see the trail network circle Little Lake connecting this site to the downtown, both to the north as an existing condition and to the south as is planned um, in the master plan. It will also provide broader active transportation and connectivity to various trail systems, such as the Rotary Trail and the Trans-Canada Trail. And that's really important. And I know Carolyn's gonna speak a bit more about that, but that connectivity between these trail systems is really critical. So let's move to the next slide. Um, during construction, um, the trail and park area will remain open for public use. As you can see from this site plan, only the area in red will be closed for construction, allowing access on the Trans-Canada Trail as well. Um, for safety, this zone will have fencing and be secured, but it's important that the, the connectivity, the active transportation is, uh, is still maintained on the site during construction. And so with that, I'll hand it off to Carolyn now to speak about the natural heritage. Thank you, Phil. Um, as an organization that values stewardship and sustainability, we are a canoe museum after all. It's really important that we approach the development of this property um, to have as little impact environmentally as possible. And thankfully we have a project team that shares those values, which is really important to us. And so I just wanna, I wanna focus on three significant elements of our approach to the site that'll, that'll illustrate where we're coming from and what, our, and what our intention is as we're thinking about how this site's gonna be used over time. So I'd like to focus first on, um, on the sort of natural, the natural elements of the property. It's a really beautiful site. It has wonderful sight lines west. Um, that point on the western side of the property faces out over the lake is one of the one of my favorite spots on the property and one that I I look forward to keeping open and available to the community and the public. Um, as Bill said, the Trans-Canada Trail runs through this site. You can see it on the map there. And it's really important for us that that is open and accessible all the time and that we work to really engage the people that are using that trail on the property in, in bigger capacities than what it, there is now. Um, so we're imagining that that the trail and the open park space around the trail remains exactly as it is today, if not enhanced through more trees and shrubs being planted. We also see that that trail connects itself through a formal pathway or a portage from, um, from the Trans-Canada Trail on the lakeside all the way over to Ashburnham. So if you're riding your bike or or walking and you need to get from Ashburnham down to the lake because you're commuting to work, we want you to go through the property in order to do that. The, um, the project is, is an integrated project and we have a lot of really invested uh, partners on this project so far. And so working with our project partners, ORCA, the city of Peter, ORCA being the conservation authority for those that aren't local, um, the city of Peterborough with our landscape team, um, with the local First Nations communities, the Michisaugi communities, as well as the Métis community, we've been developing, um, we want to develop a master plan for the site. And this master plan will focus on rehabilitation and restoration of the natural world that exists there. And so we have this wonderful opportunity to actually enhance the site through our ownership and through the stewardship activities that we wanna put in place. And so that master plan will make sure that that shoreline, which is so important for like from an ecological integrity point of view, but also in terms of making sure that the waterway remains 
as clean as it possibly can. We want to restabilize that shore, restore that shore with plantings and, and other mechanisms so that that is much more intact than what it is now. We see ourselves actually trying to, through plantings and through some of the habitat creation, actually increasing the ecological significance of the site, um, enhancing more opportunities for habitat and pollinators and making sure that the, the fish and the reptile habitat in the area is actually maintain, maintained, if not enhanced through our activities. There's some really great opportunities for programming, educational programming and interpretive programming by through the plantings that we're choosing in terms of adding native species into the mix so that the invasives are removed and we've got native species being replaced. We will have to make some changes to the woodlot that is there and many of you that use that trail on a regular basis will know that much of that forest is, um, is succumbing to the emerald ash borer and a lot of ash trees on that property that are either in different states of of decay and infestation. And so some of the trees will need to be removed. I need you to know that, that you know, that's a hard thing for us. Um, we, we know the value of woodlots. And so any impact, any cutting will be carefully considered and that we will compensate for those trees that are lost through the development of the site on the property. So again, we're replacing those trees with with native species that are again gonna enhance the ecological significance of the area and increase habitat. And again, um, do our best to, to make sure that this site is better from our use, um, our, our use of it, if, if you will. Um, again, working with our partners, you'll see that the, the building and has been placed, um, if you know this site, where the building is placed is already disturbed. So this is a part of the land that is already cleared, already disturbed. And again, we wanted to choose a location that was, that was going to reduce the amount of impact on the property. It's also placed where it is because we're wanting to respect the floodplain management principles that the Conservation Authority has put in place for this property. So it's a long and narrow building in order to fit um, to have the least amount of impact on the woodlot, to fit between the road and to also merge in with the floodplain. A couple things I wanna point out is that there's very minimal hardscaping on this property. Again, we're, it's a really special site, we're on the water. So um, reducing the amount of overland flow of water is really important. So we are using adjacent parking lots um, rather than building new parking on a beautiful piece of land, use the existing parking to support off-site off -site parking. We have core needs right on property. So all your accessible parking, coach and bus drop-offs are already considered as part of this. Um, and then the other piece is that any of the, in terms of hardscaping, any of the um, paving on the property, we're looking at permeable pavers as much as possible and putting in num a number of uh, stormwater management plans in order to just ensure that there's, there's good capture of the water that is um, landing on this site. With the Conservation Authority and our environmental consultants, they've actually recommended that we build a constructed wetland. So they're about the middle of the property, we will be looking at, we will be looking at and likely adding a wetland feature into the site. Again, that is great for overall water management of the area, but it's also a really cool teaching tool and it's a fantastic opportunity to increase habitat and diversification of, of the plant species on the property. There will be a rain garden as well and a number of other features that happy to talk to later on. Um, and I think that, that sort of captures some of our approach to the property, as you can see. Um, I will be talking later about some of the on-water programming and on-land programming, um, but I think we're probably excited to look at the building. And so I'm going to turn it over to Bill. And Bill, I would love for you to introduce the building to our community. So excited to do this. <laughs> this is fantastic. Um, so... 
When beginning to think about design, um, the mandate given um, to our team was really to create a conventional building, um, a box in essence, to house the collection and the building program. Um, the collection is the most important piece of this entire project. And, uh, and that was the clear mandate that this needed to be simple. And it was, it was about what, what the programming is and it wasn't about the building. And um, in thinking about the site and the types of spaces that were required, it became apparent that there was an opportunity to meet the mandate as well as start to bring some life to the building aesthetic as well. Um, so the building design is really inspired by the collection and the museum's values. Carolyn talked to the values earlier on. Um, for us, this building speaks about craft, speaks about construction and experience. That's, that's, that's the user experience. Um, its materiality is tactile and organic on purpose. Um, the timber components are exposed and celebrated. Um, the same way a canoe can be skinned, the facade of this building is expressed in the same manner. Uh, the building's uh, two stories, um, Carolyn spoke a bit about this, um, but that's in order to make um, the internal circulation simple and effective as well. Um, there's benefits to doing that. Uh, it creates less footprint and the building envelope is more sustainable. The building itself is about 65,000 square feet. Uh, the collection and exhibits are to the north of the entrance volume uh, where there are no windows for conservation purposes. The curve of the building that you see in the forefront um, brings the visitor walking to the site, uh, to the programming areas um, where the boathouse and on-water programs will take place just to the left. Uh, these integrate with the active trail system that we've been talking about creating various nodes that will become areas of engagement on the site for all. Um, so as we look northwest in this rendering from the southeast corner of the site, uh, the facade that faces Ashburnham opens the public lobby, bringing life to the front of the building. The glazing in the lobby that you can see there um, is, uh, is fritted glass that's bird friendly, stopping them from flying into the glass. The curve of the lobby rises because in fact, it's, you can't see it in this rendering, but there's a sloped roof. And so that curve rises to a prow at the south end of the building. Beyond the mass of that is the, the fireplace rises above the roof and a similar volume defines the entrance portal at the front. You can see the black volume coming up through and that's the main entrance to the building. And then the landscape space that you can see in front of the lobby is a, is a rain garden that's part of the overall stormwater management system. Um, so I mentioned earlier, currently we're only 16 weeks into the design process. Um, there's still a great amount of design work to do, um, but we should point out that we're reviewing many um, options to make this building more sustainable. And I think I saw a question from Ray Dart. Um, some of these approaches um, that we've been looking at are to have minimal um, glazing, really only in the spaces that it's important. So right now the building has less than 50% glazing. Um, we're looking at creating an extremely robust building envelope and, and ideally we're utilizing materials with either low embodied carbon or alternatively low maintenance and longer lifespans and I'll speak about that in just a sec. Um, and um, we're really trying to establish low impact development strategies when looking at stormwater. And I'm just going to stick to some of the sustainable pieces on the outside. But let me come back um, because I know there's been um, some questions about the cladding. And so the cladding on the building um, is Corten steel. It's a product that is designed to rust to a point and then stop. Um, originally designed, you know, about a century ago for bridges, train bridges. Um, locally, for any of you in the Peterborough area, you'll recognize Corten on the Ashburnham Mail House in East City. Uh, so Corten steel does have a high embodied carbon, but the reality is that its corrosion resistance means that um, carbon intensive coatings like paint or stain or baked on finishes that we would typically see, those can be avoided entirely because the steel itself is, is the finish. And, um, and that is the finish throughout the life of the pro product. It weathers and it ages. And there's something really quite nice and romantic about that. And it, but ultimately it gives it an extremely long lifespan and it has great potential rec for recovery through recycling at the end of its lifespan. Um, so let's, uh, let's move inside. I'm gonna go through the main entrance portal. Um, so once we've come through that, uh, the, the main entrance, 
Uh, once inside, the main lobby space is warm and inviting. It's uh, constructed of cross-laminated timber. Um, cross-laminated timber offers high strength and structural simplicity, uh, as well as significantly smaller in, um, embodied carbon than concrete or steel. Other benefits of it include quicker installation, reduced waste, um, improved thermal performance, and the design versatility. Um, and as architects, we love it for its aesthetic as well. There's something really quite biophilic and lovely about it. Um, so the purpose of this double height space that you see is to visually connect the visitor to the various program areas of the building. Um, the intent is that you can, you can see all the spaces that you want to go to. And um, so in this, in this particular rendering, you can see the reception is, is right in front of you. There's a cafe space spilling throughout the lobby. Um, the fireplace that I mentioned, you can just see the flames over the top of the reception desk there um, at the apex of the curve facing Little Lake. Uh, the workshop is open for view so that visitors can see paddle and canoe making in action. And, and at the back of the workshop, you can see that it's, uh, it's open. Um, uh, and, and that is, in fact, a glass garage door that can open to the outdoors in the good weather and, and, and what's happening in the workshop can spill out to, uh, to the outside. Um, above on the second floor, you can just see the signage for the archives um, and uh, that large uh, balcony space is the pre-function space for the multi-purpose rooms and the entrance to the gallery space. Um, it, it's, it's something that, um, you know, we're still early in design, but we're so excited about this approach. And uh, I'm going to hand it off to Jeremy now to explore some more of the interior. Thank you, Bill. And I'm just going to do a quick sound check. I hear that I was a little quiet earlier. Can you hear me well, Carolyn? You give me a nod? Great. Well, I think my job here is to describe what happens when a lively, active, and sometimes often messy client like the Canadian Canoe Museum moves into your wonderful building that we're actually designing together. Um, we are so thrilled with this space. And uh, there's so much thinking that's going on here, but when you walk into this place, authentic experience not contrived is really is really front and foremost as as bill mentioned you you're going to see you're going to see programming right in front of you all this great learning space but you're going to smell you're going to smell cedar coming out of the steam box as we're bending ribs over a canoe uh, canoe building mold you'll see the paddles being carved canoes and kayaks being dragged outside onto the sawhorses as the workshop carries on on its fourth day beautiful opportunities now because there's a campground just next to us so we can run these long courses and people can do it uh, whether in a camper or, or in a hotel or in a tent uh, so we've brought that experience right up front and foremost um, down past the calf down past the reception well that is a really important point position for our volunteers some of you know that we have well over 160 closer to 180 volunteers active uh, locally regionally and nationally but the front desk is such an important position and that's our, our that's how you're greeted and received and cared for here at the canoe museum by our wonderful community there's an elevator tucked away right there you don't see it in this rendering of course but this building is accessible throughout and uh, it's it's important to note too on the east side of the lake as you take the uh, the great trail of canada uh, formerly the trans canada trail there isn't a spot to grab a good Americano or latte and, uh, and we'll be providing that with this cafe. This really becomes a, a wonderful community hub. Uh, as, you, as you make your way around the lake, we'll be offering light food and, and, and meals. The other opportunity in this place that is terrific is this is an incredible auxiliary rental space. And can you imagine the, the rental opportunities and gatherings we can have as we open this up after hours for special events? We'll put away the chisels and tools in the workshop, clean the, uh, clean the wet paint off the, uh, off the work surfaces and, uh, and throw some nice linen down and, and host a great event in that space as well. The other uh, careful thought that's gone into this, it goes back to the, the glazing, the glass Bill mentioned, and that veil that covers um, a lot of it is allowing us to bring a certain tier within our collection uh, of canoes and kayaks out into this space. So there's no question where you are. This is not just any atrium, of course, but this is, this is very much a signature experience here at the Canadian Canoe Museum. But you, you knew that when you got out of the car because you smelled wood smoke from the hearth as you coming, as you came out of the, the bus or the, or the car and you walk across the parking lot to the Canoe Museum. If I could take us to the next slide, please. <clears throat> this is if we spun around and faced north, 
uh, back to the door that we came through. And <clears throat> you can see, of course, the Canadian Canoe Museum's uh, distinguished and signature retail space. This is a, a, a part of the museum that is, is, is much loved, uh, both in person and now online, of course, uh, in COVID days. And, and we're keeping a country happy through, through parcels uh, and curbside pickup when we're able to. To our left is the reception desk and of course that uh, elevator access to the second floor. But the main event on this, on this, uh, in, the, in the reception area is the signature experience of the Canoe Museum. That's our collection center and you can see it uh, facing us. That is the, um, the, 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 the access way for the public to join us on specially guided tours of the entire collection, which rests in there on, on individual pallet mounts on the racking. This is uh, one of the reasons why the ceiling of the ground floor is so high is so that we could fit at least 525 canoes and kayaks from around the world in here, those that are not currently on exhibit and uh, we'll be giving guided tours, but it's also not just for the, 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 the large group tours on, on a regular basis, but also for special meetings when a, when, a, when a donor family or members of a community come to see a canoe or a kayak that came from their family or their community and we can have it ready for them and we can sit with it. Um, an, important, an important feature of this entire facility is that we are aspiring for class A conservation standards. This is museum control standards. And we've been working very carefully with the Canadian Conservation Institute. These are the authorities having jurisdiction over this transformation. And I should tell you, this is an enormous change for this Canadian Canoe Museum. Uh, achieving Class A designation allows us to borrow and lend with other national and international museums uh, that have similar standards and also frankly, to care for the collection for generations and generations to come. Another important feature of the entire building design is the abilities to provide for traditional uh, object care practices, um, one of which includes smudging. Now, when you care for a collection of, of, of objects that are as large as canoes, and one of the canoes in our collection is 55 feet long, you can't just build a special room to take these objects to for um, smudging uh, or, or other practices with them. In fact, the entire museum has to be a special room for that to happen. And so we are, the, our IPD team, our integrated project delivery team and our mechanical team have been working really hard with us to create systems that can, can manage that. And the, the Canadian Conservation Institute, I'm thrilled to say, are with us as is our conservation consultant, Mike Harrington. I see he's here tonight working very carefully with us to make sure that this building meets all of those, uh, all of those objectives. Another thing I'd like to point out uh, about that collection center, and this is really exciting for us, is that an out of province family foundation has just embraced this signature experience, this, this, this gathering place, this keeping place um, uh, for $1 million um, as a naming opportunity and for their contribution and encouragement to help us see this happen. And that's from outside of province. Something that's different when you see this in real life is that the signage and wayfinding, right now you can see collection center, you can see artisan workshop. Well, that's only in English. And in fact, it'll be trilingual. Um, this will, all of the signage and wayfinding in our museum will be in English, French, and in Michisagi Anishinaabemowin. Um, we are on their territory after all, and language is going to be a very important uh, feature of the entire museum experience. When you join us on the second floor, uh, in the exhibits hall, you will uh, hear from people speaking in Inuktitut in, in Labrador dialect or in Puvirnituk dialect or in Haida or Kosalish in, in, in Snunemak or in Dene in Pikcho. So the communities that we uh, may be working with, will, you will rich, rich uh, representation, we hope, uh, of, of Indigenous languages, uh, First Nations, Métis and Inuit, and of course, Michif uh, with, with the Métis. As you journey with us to the second floor, you're taking that flight of stairs um, and that is a journey unto itself and we will be able to share stories along the way uh, as you make that big climb to the second floor, but you also have second views into the space. And now I'd like for Carolyn to take us outside. Seems there's a common theme that I get to talk about the outdoors. Um, this is one of my favorite spaces. This is the outdoor terrace. This face west, 
looking at out to Little Lake and out to the creek to the south. This is if you were following through the atrium down to the cafe area. And if you went out the doors by the cafe past the fireplace, you would land into this terrace space. And we wanted to make sure that there were spaces both inside and outside that were incredibly welcoming and warm. We wanted there to be opportunities for people to find outdoor gathering spaces, as Bill said earlier, nooks, places where, where you can gather up and, and spend some time. And so this space um, serves a number of different possibilities. It can be a cafe overflow for the cafe on a nice warm day. It can become a program space in the summer for our summer camp programming if we wanted to do some sort of craft or an activity. It's an opportunity for a group to rent it as part of an, a, an event that they want to host, host outdoors. It's also just a hangout spot for people just to gather and, and to visit with friends. And we're all craving that right now and, uh, and can imagine what that might look like in a year's time when we're able to do so, maybe sooner. I wanna point out that in the background, you're looking at a building that we're calling our canoe house. And so this is the building that will house our canoes, our kayaks, all of our program fleet. Um, it will act as the hub for on water activities that the Canoe Museum is running. It's also a wonderful point position for um, any of our outdoor experiential programs that will be happening on the land side of the Canoe Museum's programs. So this will be a great spot for, um, a, let's, let's imagine a school bus arriving with a, with a pile of kids and they're gonna spend half their day inside the building, um, up in the, in the education room on the second floor, doing their soapstone or their paddle making. And then the second part of their day, they're gonna be outside and we're gonna get them onto the water. And we wanna put them into a 36 foot long Voyager canoe and paddle through the local area and talk about all kinds of great stuff. That's where that's gonna happen. If it's a motor coach arriving from Toronto with, with tourists, they can also get into that same canoe and go Go for a canoe tour up and visit the lift lock, ride up the lift lock, come back down and come back to the canoe museum to finish up their experience. It's also a possibility for um, skills courses to be run. So an orca course where people are learning canoe and kayak skills or canoe tripping courses or a wilderness first aid course can be run out of that particular building. It's also a great spot for canoe rental or demonstration. So when we want to do a community paddling night and bring out some of the demo craft from our collection so people can experience a kind of canoe that they've never been in in their whole entire life, that's where that's gonna happen. Um, and I think the connectivity between having the, the canoe house down by the water, obviously that makes sense, but also that there's a portage trail or a, or a boardwalk that connects that boathouse, that canoe house back up to the museum, down to the Trans Canada Trail and ultimately to the shore. There will be docks, floating docks. And right now we're focusing very much on getting ourselves moved to this location. We're gonna build some, some intelligence over years as to where those docks need to go. Right now we're imagining them for the first, right now, we're imagining them um, to be on the creek side of the property rather than out at the point. But we will probably figure out whether that works or not over time and we can move them around as they are floating docks. So these will be places where people can paddle across the lake or down from the cottage or up the, cre up the creeks, um, land their canoe and kayak at the floating canoe docks bring them up on shore, put them on racks and come into the Canoe Museum or come grab a coffee. You don't need to pay admission to come in to use the, the, the public spaces, the cafe or, or, the, or the atrium area. So this will all be open and accessible community spot. Um, I think there's also some really great potential and I just wanna paint the picture of outdoor festivals along that Trans Canada Trail section. And again, the Canoe House will serve as a, as a support space for that. So I can imagine canoe festivals like a canoe rendezvous where we've got a number of different demonstrations. We've got different um, retailers putting their, their canoes and kayaks um, out on display and people can take them out onto the water for, for demonstrations and, and skills courses. 
So that is what we're thinking in terms of that outdoor space and, and again, connectivity and, and building community through the, this beautiful waterfront location. And all of this, if we want to advance, yes, Voyager Canoe Regattas, you got it. <laughs> Canoe Regattas, big festivals on the water. I mean, just such great opportunity um, as we start to get to know what this site like the site will teach us, right, of how and what we want to program. And uh, we'll certainly be able to be very responsive to, to different ideas. So all of this is happening rather quickly. As Vicki described, we've been on this major pivot journey. Um, and I know that's an overused word, but it, it makes perfect sense for the kind of, uh, the kind of challenges that we've been facing over the last year. And so now if today we're sitting in our, in our validation phase, January to June of 2021, we're just finishing that up. And then we're looking down to October for construction start. So this is between October and December is when we wanna be breaking ground, big groundbreaking ceremony, lots of gatherings and, and sort of welcoming the project to the land. And then we're anticipating that we will be open with these new suite of exhibits that Jeremy was talking about and programming, new education courses that were being offered in the summer of 2023. And it is very ambitious, um, but we have a wonderful team. And part of our gathering tonight is to talk about what are the next steps that um, in sharing these plans with our community um, making sure that you're aware of what's coming next. And so, and you also know that this is an organization that you can reach out to and, and, uh, and discuss and assist us with our planning. So over to you, Bill, to talk about next steps. Yeah, nothing like a challenge. Thanks, uh, thanks, Carol. Um, so uh, we, uh, um, as far as next steps are concerned, let me just touch on due diligence because there has been an enormous amount of due diligence done on the site um, to date, uh, both uh, studies, archaeological, um, soils, etc. Um, really, from a due diligence standpoint, what we need to do is we need to finish validation or the concept design and uh, and uh, and make sure that um, uh, this project is is um a thumbs up from uh, from everybody involved um on the rezoning side um you know the museum and the city are committed to following a full rezoning process as outlined in in the municipal act um the reason for the rezoning is to ensure that the plan planning pr parameters will really suit the use um, for the site and the building. Carolyn's talked about so much great use on the site. Um, we've got um, uses in the building like the, the cafe restaurant space that, that Jeremy spoke to. So we want to make sure that everything aligns um, from, a, from a zoning standpoint so that all of this can become a reality. Um, this process is underway and this session that we're at right now is part of that process. Ultimately, this will go to general committee and council in the early summer, and the rezoning should be in place um, by the end of July. Uh, from a site plan standpoint, um, concurrent to the rezoning, uh, site plan approval process is going to begin. Um, we've had a pre-consultation with the authorities having jurisdiction, and the goal is really to align the approvals with our construction start. And um, I can't say enough about um, the cooperation and support that we've had um, from the authorities having jurisdiction. It really has been fantastic. This has um, really been a community coming together and, um, and uh, we're looking forward to doing, uh, doing all of this due diligence to, to make this project a reality. So I'm going to just briefly introduce our Q&A panel. I'm not going to um, introduce the individuals, but basically we have representation from the owner here. We have representation from the uh, design, consulting, and construction um, team. We've got some of the advisors here on the Q&A panel, as well as the City of Peterborough. So with that, um, I think we're going to get started into the Q&A. Okay. Well, we've had quite a number of uh, questions coming in tonight, which is just tremendous. And uh, just a reminder that we will be prioritizing questions that relate to the rezoning. 
Um, so uh, Carolyn and Bill, we've had a couple of, uh, your names have been mentioned specifically, a couple of questions coming in about the planned environmental and sustainability features of the building itself, um, whether there'll be a lead standard and just, you know, how green will the building be? Want me to go, Carolyn? <laughs> um, so I think we're still, the answer is um, that we're still exploring that. And I hope um, I hope I was able to, to outline some of that um, while I was describing it. Um, you know, certainly we're, we're, we have um, looked at lots of options and as we're um, working through the concept design, we're, we're thinking about um, everything. We're doing that in the lens, obviously, of, of the conservation as well. Um, so the, uh, Jeremy referred to the, the Canadian Conservation Institute. Um, they, there are certain parameters mechanically um, that we have to meet uh, for that. There's also good design principles. So for instance, I spoke to the fact that the roof has a slope to it. Uh, we're doing that on purpose. We don't want any water stored over the collection or the exhibits. That's really important. So there's there's a certain give and take, and I think there's a lot more discussion to be had um, from the the standpoint of um, of the site itself. Um, I don't know, maybe Luke, if you want to talk to some of the, uh, the, the 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 water features that we're looking at. Sure. Uh, so we've designed a number of stormwater management strategies on site, um, and their purpose is to mimic or um, mitigate impacts of the development on the surrounding watershed. So these systems will control the quantity of water, the quality of water being released from the site, while also promoting infiltration on site. Uh, we've designed a number of low impact development strategies, we call them, or uh, they're also considered green strategies as well. And some of these strategies are rain gardens, infiltration trenches, um, and permeable pavers as well. And uh, their focus is to uh, again, promote infiltration and mimic sort of a natural uh, environment as much as possible on site. Great. So our next question, are statement wood doors made in Canada considered for the front entrance? I'd be, we are, as Bill said, just just starting to finish up the concept phase. That's the kind of thing that we'll be probably looking at a little bit further down the road. Would you say, Bill? Absolutely. Yeah. Kind of excited about that. That sounds great. <laughs> yeah. More details, please, either in the chat function or somewhere. Yeah, else. yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, we have a question, will the Sprint Canoe and Kayak Club share some of the space? A great question. The Canoe and Kayak Club has a license with the city of Peterborough and they will be, they're exploring alternative locations for their, for their activities. Um, so they will probably be somewhere adjacent and hopefully we can, we can actually leverage um, the kind of uh, synergy between our two organizations. We certainly share a lot of values and, and a promotion of paddling. So we're excited for them and, uh, and hope to be working with them on the new site. Wonderful. Um, we have a question here. I share, I support the shared parking with the soccer field lot across the road. How will the shared parking be coordinated between the soccer tournaments, high use, and major activities at this site so there isn't a conflict with parking all over the street? I can, I can certainly take that one on. Um, and I see that came from Jeff Trotmores. Nice to, nice to see your question, Jeff. Um, so we have had a, uh, a parking study completed for the project and the Canoe Museum is expected to generate a parking demand of up to 162 spaces on weekends and 157 on a typical busy uh, weekday. Um, and, and ultimately these don't typically align with, um, with the soccer functions across the street. However, the, uh, the study did look at um, the Beavermead um, campground lot, which is, is literally just to, to the south of this site as well and took that into consideration, as well as the overflow parking that the city recently created um, just north of the Parks Canada site at the intersection of uh, Marina and Ashburnham. And the conclusions were that there was a, a significant amount and substantial parking that could accommodate um, those events where multiple um, functions were happening at the same time. 
Thank you, Bill. Um, we've also had some questions come in as, as people were registering for the, uh, the webinar tonight. Um, I have a question. How can the master plan for rehabilitation and restoration influence education opportunities on the site while also providing linkages to the surrounding ecological features? That's a great question. Um, that's, that's actually probably a great question for our partner, Gary. Gary, do you want to speak to linkages and education opportunities? Yeah, thanks, Carolyn. Um, Anine, everyone. Um, yeah, that's a, a, a great idea uh, to start looking at that landscape from that lens. That's very much an Indigenous perspective of how do we actually restore balance to the city of Peterborough, Little Lake environment, and the neighboring watersheds that uh, flow by there. Um, one of the major wetland complexes is the uh, Downers Corners Wetland Complex. That's actually not what my community calls it, but that's what the city of Peterborough calls it. So uh, I want to make sure I use the right term for. Uh, for that area. Um, so when we look at site restoration, we're gonna be looking at connectivity through bats. I also looked at Lynn uh, Jackson's comment about the connectivity to the trail. So when we start restoring the site, um, we're gonna do ecological models to enhance breeding bird populations, uh, enhance bat populations, uh, so they can actually connect to those neighboring wetland complexes. The other big uh, thing is actually the um, one of the educational opportunities I thought of, because I'm an outdoor educator as well as an ecologist, is actually uh, restoring the site with ecological plants that you use in canoe building from the Anishinaabe perspective, so that we can actually, uh, uh, our chief actually and I called it canoes in waiting, right, mm -hmm. to actually start growing the materials to grow uh, and, and make canoes on site that we can transfer into the transport into the museum as part of the uh, the restoration process. And the restoration will come in actually a phased approach. We'll do the pollinators and breeding birds up front and having the bat population as a long scale, uh, long-term monitoring um, possibility in the future. So hopefully that answers everybody. Yeah. And I actually do have one more point for Glenn um, about the ash trees when I was reading the chat because I go to a lot of public meetings now that we don't get to meet in public. Uh, so for the trees that you want to use to make paddles, paddles, uh, the lumber from ash trees that are damaged by uh, emerald ash borer have to be about 12 inches in diameter and we'll have to assess them by a case by case basis, just so that we don't want to be transporting um, uh, unnecessarily any other ash trees uh, in the area. Cool. Okay. Thank you, Gary. Um, I'm seeing quite a few comments in the, the chat about uh, a green roof and also just uh, different comments about solar panels, wondering if that could be the next question. Sure, I'll take that on. Um, yeah, sorry, Carolyn, I just jumped No, it's right. great. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to talk about <laughs> roof structures. That's not my thing. Um, it's it's certainly something that we've talked about and 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 uh, there there could still be further discussion on. At this point, we're being very careful about the roof um, um, because we have the collection directly underneath uh, the roof structure. Um, we want to avoid having um, any penetrations really through the roof and try and create as seamless a roof as possible. We've we have enough case study experience um, from across the country to show that um, uh, even though uh, everyone's tried their best with, with PV and, and ballasted PV or even um, intensive green roofs or, or light green roofs that, that um, there can be issues and problems. Um, even, even locally, we've, we've seen that at, uh, at the local museum and archives um, uh, with the roof over their collection storage. So we're, we're treading very lightly and, and taking that decision very seriously still. It's, it's, it's still something that we're, we're, we're analyzing, but uh, it's, uh, it's something that we have to take very carefully from a conservation standpoint. Um, we have someone who wonders if they might have missed it. What is the capital cost of the project? So the, I can answer that. Um, so the, John, you're right. Uh, I did speak about it at the beginning. The build at the Johnson site, right now we're, we're still validating what the project cost is going to be in the end. But <coughs> thinking that it's somewhere in the range of 35 to $40 million at this point in time. We'll be able to confirm that as we finish up the, 
the actual the validation phase of this project. Okay. Um, and that kind of leads into, we have a, a series of questions from Paul Rellinger. Uh, one of his questions is, 90% of 35 to 40 million total cost is in hand. Did I hear that right? Further to that, earlier commitments from Fed's province intact as well as Western donation. Okay. Uh, so the question is that 90% of the, the total cost is, is uh, we do have. Yes, that's correct. We have 90% of funding confirmed on this project. Okay. Um, another question from Paul is testing of the soil is done and all is good? That's a great question, Paul. And yes, testing is complete. Uh, it is all good, soils and water. Um, if you'd like, uh, Thomas, perhaps you can speak at more in-depth level if you'd like to hear from an expert, not from the executive director of the museum. You're muted. As part of this process, uh, phase one and a phase two environmental site assessment was completed. And, uh, and on top of that, there's been additional works that were done to sort of verify in between um, borehole locations, etc. cetera. But uh, essentially there's, been absolutely no indication of contamination noted on the site. So that's a, a definite bonus for this uh, project moving forward. Thanks, Thomas. Um, we have someone wondering if you could say a little bit more about the mass timber construction. Mm -hmm. Bill, do you wanna handle that? Absolutely. Um, so um, I spoke a little bit about the mass timber. What's really fascinating about um, the mass timber, specifically the cross laminated timber, you've asked me to get into the weeds, I'm kind of excited, <laughs> is, is that, um, so uh, one of the partners that I showed at the beginning of the project is, is Nordique there um, uh, in Quebec. And, and Nordique um, uh, has uh, 800,000 hectares of, of their own forest, which they manage themselves. And um, so they sustainably harvest um, the wood. Usually after a, a 30 year uh, gestation period, it gets milled, it gets dried, and then it literally is laminated. So um, it gets, uh, um, it basically is, is, if you picture a lasagna getting made, um, the, the wood panels get sandwiched together like, uh, like the pasta in a lasagna. And I think that's a good analogy, Karen. <laughs> I, I and, identify with that. That makes sense. <laughs> and um, and then it's um, glued using a water-based glue um, that uh, that doesn't have any VOCs, and it's baked. Um, and then it's cut using CNC machines. And the, the, the fantastic part for us is that it comes on site um, already designed. And one of, the, one of the cornerstones of integrated project delivery is the use of building information modeling. So everything is designed um, and, and the, the cross laminated timbers are actually manufactured off site and they're just brought in and, and craned into place and it goes together like a big Meccano set. So really excited about, uh, about that partnership. And now you're thinking about lasagna. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks, Bill. Next question. I had the opportunity to visit the Royal Alberta Museum in Edmonton and was very impressed with its small computer generated displays and dioramas with both First Nations voice and English language voices. Will these types of display be considered in the museum? Jeremy? Question. Uh, I confess I haven't seen uh, those those exhibits at the Royal Alberta. Um, we're going to be working with uh, the communities, as I mentioned, across the country and with our exhibit designers for the format and delivery uh, means in the exhibits. But certainly we don't imagine, nor I think do we want our, our, our communities that we're working with wanting to just see words written in three languages or, or the, the, the different languages that are being shared, but to hear them. This is how we learn. And this is, we all have uh, 
a responsibility to support the endurance and um, sustenance of Indigenous languages across the country. And uh, the best way to do that is to to engage with it through listening and repeating. And, and so honestly, I think how that'll happen, we still need to work that out with the communities that we're working with. But I expect that you will be uh, hearing as well as reading languages, a whole number of different languages, not only in the the dominant uh, dialect, but in the ideally in the regional dialect of the communities that we're working with as well. Thanks, Jeremy. So next we have, I think that it is great to encourage visitors to arrive via bicycle or canoe, kayak, especially with the goal of reducing emissions in the city and the new ambitious city cycling, cycling plan that is in the works. However, to encourage and facilitate people using these alternative and environmentally friendly modes of transport, I think that it will be critical to have ample lock storage for belongings available to visitors, as well as locations to pull, tie up visiting canoes, kayaks at the waterfront. Will these facilities be factored in? This has been on our mind um, very much because we, our landscape team is, certainly raise this as we're thinking about what the overall what the how the overall site needs to be thought about where where bike racks are going to be going that they are visible to those that are on the cafe that people are who are arriving by canoe and kayak that there's a really easy way to get out of your canoe out of your kayak and then bring your canoe and kayak up again to a location where it can be safely secured you've got sight lines to it um, and that you can go inside and visit the museum. So these are all front of mind right now. Um, the landscape team is just recently onboarded. So we're at the very beginnings of working with them through what that approach will be like. Um, but it will be something that, that we really want to encourage. We want to make sure it's easy um, because that is at the end of the day, the thing that makes, helps us make good decisions as if it's easy and enjoyable. And uh, if, we can, if we can ride our bikes to a place and then know that we've got good secure storage and, and it's not gonna be an issue, it, it makes those decisions much more simple. So this is front of mind for us for sure. And um, there'll be a lot of opportunities for us to really learn from others and see what's working and what's not working. And I think that's what's sort of neat about our project team and, and the community and members that we've got is that there's so much um, sort of inherent knowledge in the group and it's just about bringing it forward. I hope I answered your question. Bill, do you wanna to add to it? You look like you're ready to say something. No, I'm good, I'm good. Okay. Great. Next question. As someone very involved in accessible design, I encourage you all to ensure that the disabled community can access not only the site and building, but extend that out to the trails, boathouse and docks for accessible canoeing experiences for all. Just wondering if you can expand on that. From an outdoor perspective, absolutely. That is a front of mind. The trails, the boathouse will be accessible. The floating docks are a challenge right now, but our plan is that we will end up at a location for those docks where we can eventually invest in permanent docks and, and actually build a, a proper um, lifting system so that there's fully accessible on water activities um, to anybody and everybody that wants to visit and get onto the water. The building itself is certainly being designed um, and Bill, you can speak to um, compliance and-, well, and Yeah, I, I, think, I think on the site, just to stay on the site for a minute, Carolyn, it's really important to um, talk about the fact that, uh, that obviously we're designing to AODA standards. And um, in fact, um, Brad Appleby's on the call today uh, from the city as one of the panelists. And we, we had a conversation as, as late as I think about four o'clock this afternoon, just on, on that particular topic. Um, and it's been really encouraging having the city's involvement uh, and, and speaking through that, um, certainly uh, as well, Mark Buffon, who uh, is on uh, is the accessibility coordinator for the city has been involved in, in giving us feedback. So there's lots of great dialogue happening from an accessibility side. I think one of the things that we haven't um, 
uh, touched on as well is, is the connectivity of the, the trails across and the sidewalks as well across Ashburnham. And we should probably speak to that, the fact that there will be a signalized crossing um, across Ashburnham um, that will be fully AODA compliant as well. So it's, uh, it's, it's really something that we're taking seriously um, and, uh, and obviously in the building as well. That's great. Thanks, Bill. A couple of uh, sort of financial questions. Um, do you anticipate hiring more full and part time staff than required now for your present location? Um, as we develop what the, what the programming will be and what kind of support we're going to need from staff and volunteers, that certainly will be front of mind. The business case is being is evolving as we as we determine what our programming and functional program looks like in the building. Um, but right now we are, uh, we are a not-for-profit charitable organization that uh, is very much working through the challenges of COVID and, um, and the financial uh, restrictions that COVID has caused. Um, and so this is something that's front of mind when we're thinking about the sustainability of this building. We've, we've had the advantage of and it's, it's not a great advantage, but it's the advantage of knowing what it means to operate when we are needing very lean, to be very lean and to, to um, reduce uh, sort of what the, the operating of the organization looks like. And that's what we're in right now. We're pretty bare bones as an organization at the moment. And then we also know what it looks like to operate in, in really full times so when we have a full complement of staff and volunteers in this place is packed full. So when I look at when we've been thinking about this new museum and this building, we wanted to make sure that we could run it in both really busy and full times and also when things were super lean and needed to be super tight. And so I think by, um, I think the, it will really depend, uh, it will fluctuate over time. We will be, we're gonna go through all kinds of different transitions as an organization over the next 10, 20, 30 years. Um, but there certainly will be a much stronger cohort that's gonna open this museum than what we've got today. I'll guarantee you that. We've had a comment or a suggestion rather to take pictures of the trees from standing to final use. Just wondering if uh, could Gary comment on that? Sure, Gary, would you love to answer that? Sure, uh, that's, a, that's a neat idea. Um, I've done that actually at other sites I've worked on where we've like, you know, um, design sites and it's like, hey, this is what it looked like before and this is what it looked like after. Um, I also, <laughs> as a sidebar, I actually like to document the trees and how they're uh, living on the side of the shores of Lake, uh, Little Lake because I'm actually worried about the shoreline stability of, the, uh, of Little Lake because of the effects of the Trans Severn Waterway. Um, so, you know, those are really uh, important trees there. They're very big. Uh, they do provide a lot of overhead cover and I'm actually worried about uh, the potential of losing those big trees. Um, as a, a indirect operation, uh, operational cost of the Trans Severn. So that's, a, that's important to, to document the site, uh, to see what's there. And hopefully um, one of the things I'm working on in, in my own First Nation is making a seed collection so we can actually keep uh, the Peterborough uh, diversity and genetics of plants uh, within the Peterborough region so we can actually re, uh, uh, restore these sites that are uh, impacted by uh, settler uh, opera operations. Thank you. Okay, Thanks, Gary. Um, we have a question about, will the exhibit signage also include Braille? Hmm. Jeremy, do you wanna go with that? Uh, we are, we're not at that point yet in terms of ways and means in the exhibit development uh, and the budget that we're carrying for that. Right now, the, the focus has been on, um, as a priority supporting the indigenous languages that are reflected in that, uh, in that exhibit hall. Uh, I'm gonna have to get back to you on that, I think, uh, in terms of Braille, but at this point, uh, no, I don't think so. We may be looking at some other opportunities through uh, app applications, through apps 
an audio uh, interactivity with our guests uh, so that they can uh, access uh, all areas of the exhibits as well. Okay. So uh, will floating docks and access ways and storage impact the shoreline? Some of the site's beauty is the natural shoreline. Mm -hmm. I think most of the site's beauty is the natural shoreline. It's one of my favorite parts. Um, the One of the options of, of starting off with floating docks is because it, it does have the least impact on the shore at this point in time. And so it gives us the most opportunities to just, rather than doing the kind of construction and in-water work that we need to do to put in permanent docks at this point, um, we're going to go with floating to get us started and see where, where we want to invest and when we want to invest. Um, and Gary, you've unmuted yourself. Is that because I'm just looking at my group? They look, you look like you wanted to add into that. So I'll agree with that. Um, I, I always recommend uh, uh, people actually um, do fish. Uh, I call them fish friendly docks. They're a floating dock system. They have the minimum, uh, minimum impact to the bottom of the lake. Uh, I actually prefer people to do canoe, like a, a designated spot for storage, uh, as well as walking, so that we don't trample the native vegetation uh, in the area. And that's the big thing that um, I actually grew up down the street from where the site is. So just, I didn't actually say that. So when we moved out of Curve Lake, we actually moved like literally down the street. Um, and my wife's not up here to hear this comment, but I used to be a lifeguard at, at the beaches too, which is like back in the day, not so much anymore. So, um, and, uh, you know, and, and one of the things I know is the volume of people that come through that area and, and the volume of people that trample the shoreline. And so that's one of the things I'm looking at at the restoration perspective is how can I keep that shoreline intact? Um, you know, keep healthy buffers from the shoreline while allowing people to access the site as well. So I am actually looking to make designated pathways to get to the water and to provide um, uh, access, but also protect the natural connectivity along the shoreline for turtles. Um, there is a beaver that lives there that we saw when we're in the field. So we need to maintain those corridors for everything that lives there. That's scary. How are we doing, Kate? Oh, sorry. We had someone note that um, there will be plans to involve Fleming College. How, uh, how will that be done and uh, which program? Bell? Nope. <laughs> um, so we're still in early stages, as I said during the presentation. But um, uh, we we have reached out uh, to the skill to the skill skills trade program, and um, it would be really great to get some involvement. Um, the you know in 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 my own head, how I I see this working is um, uh, we have the canoe house, and it's a it's a great opportunity as a as a a reasonably sized building to get students involved in construction. And, uh, and so we see that as an opportunity. There's all kinds of other opportunities that we're starting to explore um, when we start thinking about um, how we, uh, how we uh, bring other teams into this project to, to help us with, with, with it. Jeremy, you've got your hand up, how formal. I do, I do, I do. I, I couldn't let that question go without chiming in too, Bill, thanks. Um, the Canoe Museum has had a terrific relationship with Fleming College over the many years, many, many, many years, uh, working with the students and the faculty there. And uh, don't forget that we have to move 600 canoes from this museum to that museum. Actually, cool fact, if you lined all of the canoes up nose to tail, it would take you all the way from this museum, three kilometers to our future home. And these canoes need to be cleaned, documented, condition reported, photographed, all of that uh, brought into our database as they're prepared on their pallets for transport to the new museum and so on. And so there's gonna be a tremendous amount of work uh, and we hope, Gail, I think you're on the call tonight. Great to see you here. I hope Deb is too, uh, Cindy. So we will uh, be doing that. But I should also point out, we have um, been really proud of our relations with many uh, interns from Fleming College over the years. We had two last fall, uh, we, had, we have one right now and we're onboarding two more in the coming weeks ahead. And so there'll be a lot of opportunities for interns to get, get uh, as, as we call it, real world experience uh, working with a, 
a, a crazy, wonderful collection like the Canadian Canoe Museums to help us move from here to there. Lots of opportunities. Okay. Would there be a spot in the new museum to highlight historic voyager routes like the Lavaz Portage here in North Bay? Mm. Over to you, Jeremy. Over to me, Jeremy. Well, I'm actually standing, I'm, I'm in the museum's exhibits hall right now and I can see the Lavaz Portage on a map not, not far from here. Um, but uh, we do have certainly one exhibit zone that is the connected by canoe exhibit zone where we are looking at those points of intersection that will in part of what it does really do a, a wonderful uh, exploration of the fur trade uh, and the mechanics of the fur trade, the, 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 the canoe routes, the many port portages, uh, maybe some of the rapids that are named after drowned voyagers and so on along the way. So, you know, there will be definitely opportunities for us to explore those routes um, that, uh, that are connected through indigenous uh, footpaths and nostalgian portages uh, from coast to coast. Great. Wonderful. Um, what security measures are envisaged for the museum and the property? Hmm. Who wants this one? Bill, do you want to speak about security or I'm happy? I'm happy to start too. What? Sure, why don't you go? And... Okay. okay. So um, we've had these discussions um, already in terms of a very preliminary just to get us started. And one of the things that, um, that Bill spoke about earlier was making sure that there's um, that this, the actual outdoor spaces are well lit, that they are, they are um, well designed so that there are not any sort of um, really spe specifically uh, dark or, or sort of small corridors where people can hang out in. Um, we are an organization that runs generally on a shoestring, to be very honest with you. And, um, and we do fundraise and earn everything that, that we need to operate this organization. And it, and it uh, usually ends up, um, we end up in a good place at the end of every year, but it's always, um, it's always a tight race. So when we're thinking about security for the future museum, we wanted to make sure that we're building in systems that we can actually manage. So though, and that we can actually operate. And so there will be uh, security systems within the building that will meet all of the needs that we need um, in terms of running a, a major national museum as us, as we are. And then outside, there'll be very careful placement of um, cameras or other installations to make sure that we have the coverage that we need. But it, it, it quite honestly, it will not be excessive. Um, we, are, we are going to do what we can and make sure that it serves our needs. And then um, I think a lot of the security comes from people invested in the organization and the spaces. And so again, building strong community on the site where people can contribute to the betterment of the property, plantings, volunteer participation, it just can, it can lead to a, a much um, healthier community as a whole and, and hopefully a place that people don't wanna vandalize or, or, or hang out or, or make a mess of at the end of the day. That was probably a bit, not a very technical answer. <laughs> if somebody was looking for technical, they did not get it from me. Well, we we, <laughs> we don't want to give up the laser locations. On, on security more so than anything. <laughs> well, anyhow, it's getting late. I'm sorry, you're going to start <laughs> trickling down. All right. Um, you you are correct there, me Carolyn. Keep me um, I was just going to note the time and I think we are, I, I apologize here, we still have so many questions. It's wonderful to see so people so invested in what we're doing. We really are down to our last question though and um, it's kind of a tough one. So okay. Carolyn, Bill, Jeremy, Vicki, everyone, all of our panelists, what is the biggest challenge at this point in the development of the new museum? Ooh.
Anybody? Yeah, I want to go. I, I put my hand up. We should all answer. <laughs> Why don't we all say what our big challenge is? That would be cool. Bill? Well, I think I think it's schedule. Like I think we're all so committed to to making this happen in 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 the same time frame as the previous project that I think that it's it's been a lot of fun and 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 exciting to to aim for construction this fall. I think we've got an incredible team on board here. I'm just looking at all the faces. Um, there's been super commitment from the the city and Brad's on the call tonight and we've got Scott here from Shandos who's been leading things from the builder standpoint and um, you know Thomas from an advising standpoint it's everybody has come and and is meeting this challenge which is so cool that's my answer Vicky I, I think the well I, I can't disagree with um, Bill but I just think the challenge of timing is 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 meeting that timeline and um is my biggest challenge and uh, i think along with the board and and what feeds into that timing and that we can make all those deadlines and i believe we can so while it's a challenge i think you you, you have to you have to continue to look at the other end of it and say that's the star we're shooting for and we're going to make it Scott, did you want to say something? Um, yeah, sure. I think I think the beauty of this project, and I think everybody might agree, I can't speak on everybody's behalf, but just the alignment of the entire team is time can be our friend or can be our enemy. And I think in an IPD project, um, it takes the amount of time to answer questions and just almost eliminates it. So if there was if there was anything that we could focus on and say is, is a positive is the fact that you know, the response from each of these team members is almost immediate. It's not traditionally thinking uh, in a construction or a building environment. So when we say time is our is our enemy, you know, that's normally what happens in a construction project, but in an IPD project, time can be our friend because we can respond so quickly and the team responds so efficiently, effectively to answer questions and challenges that um, I'm, I'm just like v Vicky, I just, I'm so, incredibly pleased and proud to be part of this team because you know we attack challenges um, in a very timely manner and I think that will be the success of the project. And I spoke once, wow. <laughs> mm. I think um, I think one of the challenges, uh, one challenge that I think, uh, I struggle with is is the balance of expectations on on what we can achieve in the time and the budget that we have, and um, to what the community and to what our donors and members and ultimately ourselves that what we want out of this first round of the project. And I think there's opportunity that comes with that. I think that having the constraints of the, the schedule and the scope and the budget and the, this pivot gives us this chance to just make decisions quick and do the best we can with what we have at this point in time. And to know, and this is the magic part for me, to know that we can, we can, we can implement more things down the road. We don't have to do it all now. We get, to, we get to start somewhere on this site, just like we've been on this property here for 25, 20 plus years. We didn't have everything right when we started, but we have evolved into this incredible organization over the last number of years. And I just, I'm excited about where we, when we leave this place and we go to our new site and then what that evolution looks like for the next 10, 15, 20 years. Like, we don't know where that's gonna go. I just trust that we've got an amazing group of people that are guiding us along the way and it's gonna be a really neat journey. And uh, I wonder if those are closing thoughts. <laughs> Maybe I will turn it over to Vicki to, to close out our, our session. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, and thank you all for um, being here tonight. You've heard lots of lots of our plans and lots of what we hope to accomplish. Jeremy started by talking about the 70 year history. And I just want to say that this has been an incredible and um, just everybody who's at the table, who's been participating, 
always seems to come through, everything seems to come through in the, uh, through meeting our deadlines and our timelines. But it, it, the other part of it is the commitment of people around that table, the commitment to make it happen. And, you know, tonight I noticed that at the end of this um, presentation, there's still 150 people on the line. I think that's pretty incredible. So this concludes our, our meeting tonight. And again, miigwech, thank you and merci. Um, thank you for coming to learn about what we have been thinking about and working towards for the last year, just about a year. Well, actually not quite a year, but, um, and as for next steps, a recording of this project will be available on our website as of Monday. Um, we ha also have a very efficient technical team. Um, we encourage you to visit our website if you haven't already done so. And for, for more information about the museum, um, including a frequently asked questions document, you can sign up for our newsletter if you'd like to receive it. And lastly, if you're inspired and would like to contribute to our fundraising camp campaign, please get in touch with our team by email or visit the Canoe Museum um, website at canoemuseum.ca. Good night, everyone. Take care and be well. Thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy.